happy little games. Hello everybody and welcome back to part two of the history of Castlevania. The response to part one has been overwhelmingly positive except for one thing. My pronunciation of the word Akumajo. Now I did my due diligence like any self-respecting YouTuber should to learn the proper way to say the word. But apparently it was as wrong as a goat with two buttholes. So let's take a moment to learn the proper pronunciation. Akumajo. 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 And now I am quite the expert on the proper pronunciation. Thank you, YouTube. Now on with the show. Konami decided to use some of that patented Sega Blast processing power and brought Castlevania Bloodlines to the Sega Genesis. As the story goes, Count Dracula finally gets to take some well-deserved R&R. The Count's niece, Elizabeth Bartley, suddenly appears in the 20th century to wreak havoc. She orchestrates the beginning of World War I in order to fully resurrect her uncle. The main character that you play as is John Morris, who is the son of Quincy Morris. Quincy was killed at the end of the original Dracula novel, which for the first time, this Castlevania game tries to tie itself into the mythology of the book. We learn throughout the game that the Morris lineage are descendants of the Belmonts. Therefore, it's up to you and your best friend, Eric Lacard, to stop the Prince of Darkness himself. Speaking of Eric, apparently a vampire killed his girlfriend and he wants revenge. John has a standard whip that can be upgraded and can also cling to any ceiling to swing across pits. Eric has a spear which feels like it has a lot of weight behind it when using. This can also be upgraded with the most powerful being multiple blades at the end of the spear. There are also spots where you have to use Eric and his spear as a pole vault to access certain areas which is a nice touch. It is nice to have a different character to play as with completely different mechanics, but for me personally, I always preferred the whip. That's what she said! <laughs> The gameplay is pure Castlevania and Konami have outdone themselves once again. We get a few remade stages from previous Castlevania games, but the Genesis hardware is working overtime to provide some magical special effects and visual trickery. A lot of these were commonplace on the Super NES due to the Mode 7 hardware, but not so much on Sega's 16-bit machine. You will encounter rotating stages, giant multi-jointed boss characters, impressive water effects, and more. It's something you have to experience for yourself to truly appreciate. The music itself is also fantastic, being composed by Michiru Yamani, who has quite the knack for getting the most out of Sega's audio hardware. One more thing to mention is, at the time, this was by far one of the most gore-filled Castlevania games on the market. From the title screen, which features bones soaking in a pool of blood, to killing zombies and watching their torsos rip apart. Even when you play as Eric and he dies, his spear is hurled up in the air and comes down impaling him. Keep in mind that any depiction of blood and gore were removed from the European release, and that included the name change from Bloodlines to the new generation. The game itself also has multiple difficulties with easy mode removing certain stages and boss fights. There are also multiple endings depending on which difficulty you play on. In 1995, Castlevania Dracula X was released for the Super Nintendo. Apparently, Konami ran out of ideas for names and decided to use Dracula X even though it was already used for the PC Engine version. While initially many people thought this was just a port of the PC Engine version, it is a brand new game that uses the same characters and controls. Similar to Konami's Castlevania 3 on the NES, 
they decided to throw everything they could into it, but due to the limited cartridge size, they were not quite as successful. You only get to play as Richter Belmont, with Maria being in the game as a character you have to find and rescue. Annette is also another character that has to be found, but the other two characters are not even included in the game. There are 9 levels in total, which is a step back from the 13 found in the PC Engine version. The gameplay is very similar and feels through and through like a traditional Castlevania game. You have your standard whip and also the various sub-weapons just like in the previous games. The backgrounds are nicely detailed with plenty of Mode 7 trickery that are a joy to behold. The sprites are large and well animated and everything has a certain weight about them. The boss fights feature giant sprites although not quite as big as the multi-jointed ones found in Castlevania Bloodlines for the Genesis. The music and sound effects are excellent, putting the Super Nintendo hardware through its paces. While obviously not quite as good as the PC Engine Super CD version, it is still really well done. Obviously the anime cutscenes had to go but there is a nice intro and ending sequence. There is also a handy password feature. It's hard not to compare this to the original PC Engine version, and if you do, you will be disappointed. As a standalone Castlevania game on a cartridge format, it's really good, although not quite the masterpiece as previous entries. Symphony of the Night for your PlayStation from Konami. In 1997, the 32-bit era of 3D graphics were among us. Certain people absolutely loved the downright sexy polygons and turned their nose down at traditional 2D sprite-based gaming. Konami wasn't having any of this and decided to release Castlevania Symphony of the Night on the original PlayStation. They decided to go with the action slash RPG hybrid as found in Castlevania 2. This was dubbed Metroidvania by the press which is easily recognizable due to the very similar format found in both games. The game itself is open ended although some doors are not accessible from the beginning meaning you have to backtrack after gaining certain powers or items to proceed. As the storyline goes. This is a direct sequel to Dracula X for the PC Engine, with the game starting out just before the climactic battle with Dracula. Using Richter Belmont, you once again defeat Dracula and all is well. The storyline fast forwards five years and Alucard, the son of Dracula, awakens from his slumber and has noticed that the demon castle has reappeared. At this time, Richter Belmont has also disappeared. You take on the role of Alucard who has to explore dear old dad's castle to find a mysterious entity who is controlling Richter Belmont who proclaims to be the lord of the castle. The controls in the game are top notch with your starting weapon being a sword instead of a whip. The animation is extremely smooth and detailed and so are the backgrounds. The standard sub weapons also make a return but there are new ones as well including holy ashes which are similar to holy water lightning and crystals which shoots all over the screen among others. Added to your arsenal is a nice double jump as well as the ability to transform into three different entities including a bat which lets you fly, a wolf which lets you run really fast and a mist which will let you squeeze into tight spaces in the walls. Your character also has a number of magic spells which will drain on a separate magic meter. The more enemies you kill, the more experience points you receive, which results in you leveling up. Your character also has four attributes, which include strength, defense, intelligence, and luck. There are also a wide variety of weapons to assist you in your quest. During the game, your character can acquire the ability to summon familiars, which are entities that aid you in the battle and exploration. The goal of the game is to search for Dracula's body parts and bring them back to the castle for the epic final showdown, 
which is exactly what you had to do in the second game in the series on the NES. After beating the game, you do have the option of playing through as Richter Belmont, but the storyline stays the same. Did I mention how absolutely fantastic the graphics were? This is without a doubt one of the best versions of Castlevania on the market, and here we are 23 years later and still holding it in such high regard. There are literally over 100 different types of enemies to face along the way, with some massive end-level bosses, some of which take up multiple screens. The music is something else entirely and was composed by Michiru Yamani, who had done a phenomenal job on Castlevania Bloodlines for the Sega Genesis. I can't say it enough that the music is phenomenal and any self-respecting fan of Castlevania should definitely check it out. Now even though as a Castlevania purist I prefer the whip, but the switch to the sword is a nice change of pace. As I mentioned, this is one of the best versions of Castlevania on the market, and if you've never had a chance to try it out, pop that bad boy in and give it a shot. There was a version released for the Sega Saturn which is not quite as good, as well as numerous re-releases over the years on Xbox Live and the PlayStation Network. A version for the iOS and Android platforms were released in 2020. If your eyes had melted from all the glorious colors of Symphony of the Night, then perhaps you should have checked out 1998's Castlevania Legends for the original Game Boy. This is the third and final entry on the original Game Boy, in which you take on the role of Sonya Belmont, the first vampire hunter in her clan to take down Dracula during the Middle Ages. She does move just a little bit faster and is a little bit more nimble than the main characters in the previous game. She can also crouch and move which is a new feature and control her jump in mid-air. Instead of the traditional sub-weapons, your character receives soul powers at the end of each level and can be switched between at any time. Some of the soul powers allow you to freeze your enemies, heal yourself, and shoot out energy among others. If you press the A and B button together, you'll activate burning mode which temporarily makes you invincible and increases your speed. This does use up some of your life gauge, so use it wisely. There are six stages in total with an extra one being hidden. The graphics are adequate, but don't really pop off the screen like other Castlevania adventures. The music is average at best, which is unfortunate because it is such a big part of the gameplay experience. Chronologically, this was supposed to be the first in the series showing the origin of the Belmonts vs. Count Dracula. Longtime Castlevania producer Koji Igarashi would go on to call this game an embarrassment and would also have it removed from the timeline saying that it conflicted with the main plot of the original game. In 1999, after much resistance, Castlevania finally entered the third dimension with its release on the Nintendo 64. When the title officially made its debut at the Tokyo Game Show in 1997, it was initially called Castlevania 64, but was later changed to just Castlevania. You get your choice of two characters, the first one being Reinhard Schneider, who is a whip-wielding son of a gun, or you can play as Carrie Fernandez who uses magic as her primary weapon. As the story goes, it is 1852 and Dracula has awoken from his 100 year sleepover. The two young heroes have sensed his return and set out on a quest to Transylvania to vanquish the evil count once and for all. Reinhard Schneider is actually a descendant of the Belmont clan. Each character has their own strengths and weaknesses, with Reinhardt's whip being strong but slow. 
Carrie's use of attacks includes flying magical balls which can be charged up. Both characters still use the standard sub-weapons which are powered by gems instead of hearts. The gameplay is similar to Symphony of the Night which means it's a standard action RPG. As far as the controls go, it uses an auto lock system which for the most part works okay. When it comes to the platforming sections, and there are quite a few of these, it gets a little more clumsy but as long as you are holding the button as you jump you can grab onto the platform and pull yourself up. It's by no means perfect but it does help. The game takes place across 10 levels ranging from the Transylvania Forest to Dracula's Castle. The game is partially open-ended meaning you have to search around pulling switches and finding keys to exit the level. You will encounter some unusual bosses including a chainsaw wielding gardener and his demonic dogs. There are also elements of the survival horror genre where you are placed in situations of stress, vulnerability and anxiety. Gameplay elements that are unusual in the world of Castlevania. It's possible to be trapped in cage fights with monsters or crushed by a giant ceiling if you don't defeat your enemy in enough time. Another one has you in the Villa Maze Garden where you have to escape the labyrinth while enemies are chasing you down. There is a night and day cycle but the only difference is that certain doors become unlocked at night. This also affects when characters will talk to you as they will only speak to you at certain parts of the day. Also, if you take longer than 16 days to complete the game, you will get the bad ending in which Dracula prevailed. Thankfully, there is multiple save points throughout the game. The bosses are absolutely huge and they look really good. The graphics are simply adequate for an early 3D polygon based game. It has a lot of the usual Nintendo 64 trappings such as fog and pop-in which Castlevania apologists always defend as adding to the atmosphere. Personally, I think it looks terrible and I always have even when I first played it 20 years ago. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Some games are meant for 2D sprite based gameplay and in my opinion this is one of them. I applaud Konami's efforts but in my opinion they just didn't pull it off. The camera is another problem which again also plagued other early 3D games. It tends to have a mind of its own especially when fighting the bosses. The music as well, thanks to the cartridge format is not as good as the previous entries including Symphony of the Night. What is there is pretty good, but there just isn't much of it. Some levels are played in almost complete silence and others the soundtrack is very muted making it hard to hear. As I mentioned throughout this video, music is an important part in a Castlevania game. If it's not done correctly then you lose something in the overall experience. Late 1999, Castlevania Legacy of Darkness was released for the Nintendo 64. This is more of a director's cut of the original Castlevania and not an outright sequel. This is a remake of the original game featuring improved graphics, new levels and new villains. In this game you take on the role of Cornell, a powerful werewolf who is seeking out the evil demons who are responsible for his sister's disappearance. Cornell has upgradable weapons with three different levels of strength. The game is a prequel to the original Castlevania on the Nintendo 64 with more emphasis on platforming and puzzle solving. You also have new bosses and plot twists to contend with as well. Once you play through as Cornell you can unlock Carrie and Reinhardt side quests. The game does make use of the Nintendo 64's expansion pack add-on which allows for the use of high res textures. While the high res textures makes the game look better, the frame rate does suffer a bit because of it. Similar to the first game, what is there of the music is good but there's just not much to it. 
There are some nice unlockables such as bonus costumes. Both Nintendo 64 games have had their spot removed on the Castlevania timeline. According to director Koji Igarashi, they were removed because they were considered side projects and not part of the official storyline. In 2001, Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance. This was the follow-up to the extremely successful Game Boy, which essentially gave you the power of a Super Nintendo right in the palm of your hands. One of the early titles for the system was Castlevania Circle of the Moon, a return to its 2D sprite-based roots in non-linear fashion. While the Game Boy Advance was much more powerful than the standard Game Boy, it still didn't have a backlit screen, so with Castlevania's visuals already being a bit on the murky side, it made seeing everything all the more difficult, unless of course you purchased a third-party add-on light. Thanks to the release of the Game Boy Advance SP, which added a built-in backlight, and eventually emulation, the gameplay experience is a whole lot better and a whole lot brighter. The story takes place in 1830 in which you as Nathan Graves, who along with his friend Hugh Baldwin, are sent into Dracula's castle to stop Carmella from resurrecting him. Your primary weapon is the whip, along with your standard set of sub-weapons as found in previous games, only one of which can be carried at any given time. The gameplay itself is a perfect marriage of non-linear exploration and straight-up action. There are certain parts of the game where abilities have to be unlocked before you can advance such as double jump, wall kick, and being able to run. The graphics are nice, although a bit uninspired at times, but there are a lot more platforming elements to liven things up. The game does incorporate RPG elements such as hit points, the amount of damage you can sustain, magic points, and so on. The more enemies you defeat, the more items and XP you will gain until your character eventually levels up. After you defeat boss characters, you will gain certain power-ups and abilities. Something else that is new is the DSS or Dual Setup System, which are magic cards that fall into one or two categories of action and attribute. You take one card from each category and combine them with a total of 100 possible combinations. By combining these cards, you equip your character with new weapons such as dropping the whip for a sword or a hammer. Some will actually increase your overall stats and others will provide elemental shields, projectiles, explosives, etc. You can only equip these items one at a time though. What makes the game so difficult is that certain monsters will drop these cards and it's unbeknownst to you which ones will do so. Also included in the game is the Battle Arena, which features much more difficult monsters to defeat, but also has some brand new unlockables. The music itself is good, although not quite up there with the Super Nintendo standard. Overall though, it's a great little addition to the Castlevania series, especially in the palm of your hands. The Castlevania fans who were clamoring for the X68000 version but never had a chance to try it here in the States finally got their wish in 2001 when Konami released Castlevania Chronicles for the PlayStation 1. This is essentially a port of that version which is a remake of the original Castlevania for the NES. What this means is that a lot of the extras such as multiple player characters, alternate levels, and animated cutscenes were not included in the game. Even though it goes back to the basics, it still feels like Castlevania through and through. 
Instead of six levels, the game takes place across eight, with certain levels being expanded upon. The sub-weapons are essentially the same, but you do have a healing herb which can replenish your health at any given time. Some of the boss fights have also been changed, making them much more difficult. The graphics themselves are absolutely fantastic with nice, smooth animation and exceptional background detail. The music is fantastic with Vampire Killer and Wicked Child being totally redone and sounding great. Among the other added features are an arranged mode with redone sprites and new designs. It also features fancier explosions, brand new CGI intro and ending movies, but honestly they don't really fit into the overall aesthetic of the game. There is also a new soundtrack arrangement which sounds good, but personally I prefer the original. The arranged mode also includes multiple difficulty levels. This is definitely one to play, especially if you are a fan of the original Castlevania game. And that wraps up the history of Castlevania Part 2. We still have a ways to go and a number of games to check out, so tune in next time for the history of Castlevania Part 3. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. Also, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.